Deb. Uh, this is now uh, our final time together, and I want to try to pull a lot of things together for us now. We've looked at the dynamics of humor, the goals of humor. We've looked at the Old Testament roots of humor. I tried to do a, le a little sketchy, but at least you got some feelings for that. We tried to look at our Lord and uh, the whimsy that I think Chesterton had in his mind with regard to our Lord and what he says in dialogue, and we just touched the surface of that. Now, you'll be watching for that now, won't you? And the, uh, what our Lord did in the teaching of the parables, following that Old Testament tradition, and then what our Lord uh, did in, his, in, in the events of his life, his miracles, and the, what, what he did when he actually uh, shows humor by what he does. Now I want to talk about the source of humor. Because we have really the, the, the great biblical source of humor. And it is one great word. There's, there are four great words in the pantheon of Christian vocabulary. Faith, hope, love. Like Paul says in, in, in Corinthians, abide these three. But there is a fourth word too. And that's the word joy. And I want us to look at the word joy in the Bible and try to really understand this word. Uh, I believe the word appears uh, conceptually. The first appearance of the word, really, for us is actually in the, in the, Benedict, in the uh, blessing that was given to Moses by God when he gave Moses a blessing for Israel. And that blessing is sheer gospel. It's in the book of Numbers uh, where the Lord said to Moses, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus shall you bless the Israelites. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now the word bless... There are two main words for bless in the Old Testament Hebrew. One is the word uh, barak, which means to bow, like bless the Lord, O my soul. That's Psalm 103. It means bow. And then the other great word for bless is ashar, which is used in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man or woman who walks not in the way of the wicked, but walks in the way of the righteous. And there the word blessing means to find the right road. And that's the great biblical word for success. You're successful when you find the right road. See, you walk not in the way of wickedness, but in the way of the Lord. Now, the interesting thing about Barak, the Hebrew word for bless, in the Psalm 103, is that that word, when it refers to us, you have to understand this about the Hebrew uh, vocabulary. Hebrew words often do double duty because it's a more primitive language than Greek or English is. And so words do double duty. So the word bless, when it refers to us, means bow. It's the great worship word. Bless the Lord, O my soul. It is the great worship word of the Old Testament to bow before the Lord, to recognize who the Lord is. And that's the word barak. By the way, in Hebrew, the Hebrew only has consonants. It doesn't have vowels, so it would look like that. In Hebrew, it would be like that, barak. A shar would look like that. And uh, so bless means bow. Now, in this benediction, or in this blessing that's given, though, in the book of Numbers, the Lord bless you and keep you, the word that's used here is barak. And not ashar, the Lord help you find the right road, like in Psalm 101. And so when the word bless, barak, refers to God, it shouldn't be translated bow, it should be translated stoop. We bow, God stoops. So literally, the wonderful blessing that is the beloved blessing of the Old Testament is that the Lord stoop toward you and keep you. And that makes the rest of this blessing so powerful. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. See, it's the Lord stooping down to where he can see your face. Like a, a, someone stooping down to the face of a little child. The Lord stoop to you and keep you Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The great love word that's used there. And now the wonderful word. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And that's the Hebrew word smile. There's the mirth. 
the Lord enjoys you. He smiles on you. In Hebrew, to lift your countenance is the word for smile in Hebrew. Just like to, lo to lower your countenance is, is the word for grief. Uh, Cain's countenance fell, means he was discouraged. But to lift your countenance is to smile. See, the Hebrews always think concretely. So the Lord, it should translate literally, if you want to translate this uh, blessing literally, the Lord stoop to you and keep you. I love what St. Augustine said, proud man would have died had not a lowly God found him. God stooped to us. The Lord stoop to you and bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. See, his face, so that you can see his face and be gracious to you, love, and love you. And the Lord smile upon you and give you peace. All right, I want us to think about that word smile uh, for the rest of our time today. The great word for it uh, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament, then, the exuberant word for this is the word halal. And all the, uh, wow, all the halal psalms are the praise psalms of the Old Testament. When it occurs to us that God has smiled upon us, then we praise God and we thank God. And that's the word halal in Hebrew. And uh, the great New Testament word for this is the word joy. Uh, to rejoice in the smile of God on our side. It's God's smile, our rejoice. I want to just give you a little quick word study here so that we can get this word in our mind. The word joy is chara in Greek. And chara it literally means, it means surprise in, in classical Greek. And, but it becomes the root of a lot of words in, in the New Testament. For instance, the Apostle Paul uses a, a larger form, charis, and charis is the word that's translated grace in the New Testament. And it's a kind of coined word by the Apostle Paul. It's a part of his love vocabulary. And charis means uh, surprising love. Uh, that's really like, sometimes it's translated unmerited love, grace. But it's the word translated grace in English. But it's from the word chara, which means surprise. And then if you take this word and use the long form, charismata, uh, that's the word that appears in 1 Corinthians 12, translated gifts, the so-called gifts of the Holy Spirit. In fact, we even use that word in secular use <coughs> the same way. A charismatic person is a highly gifted person. Notice, all from this word surprise. There's a surprise element in charis, the love by surprise, and there's a surprise element in charismata, gifts. See, gifts come by surprise, okay? Giftedness, we talk about a gifted person. Uh, you can't hardly put your finger on it. They're just charismatic, they're gifted. And that's the word for gift in the New Testament. Now, there's one more key word in the New Testament from charismata. If you take the EU, in Greek, EU always means good as a prefix. Uh, take, uh, for instance, take the word logos and you put an EU in front of it and you have eulogy, good word. Or take the word phono, sound, and put an EU in front of it and you have euphemism, good sound. Here's a bad one. Take the word thanatos, death, and put an EU in front of it and you have euthanasia, good death. So there's a lot of words that are made from EU. Here's one of the big ones. Take this word chara, ua, eucharist, and that's the Lord's Supper word, but it means literally thanksgiving. So look at all the key words, the key worship words in the New Testament that come from this word, chara, uh, coming out of God's smile for us and our response to that surprise, the surprise that God smiles on us, chara, surprise, that's the word translated joy. In fact, in modern Greek, Greek language usage, this word joy is the word that's used to greet each other on the street. Not the word uh, shalom, like the, the Jews use the word shalom, peace, to greet each other. And the Greeks use the word chara to greet each other. Still do. Joy. Surprise. It's like, I'm surprised to see you. See? Joy. Chara. And then charis is the, the love word. Surprise love. Okay? Charismata, gift. Surprise gift. 
you charismata, you charist, thanksgiving. So you, again, thanksgiving is a kind of a wonderful word. It means uh, it's a good surprise gift, and that's thanksgiving. By the way, that's why you can't say to someone that you can't demand of someone they give thanks to you. That would be an oxymoron because then it wouldn't be a good surprise gift. Like, all I want is a little thanks around this house. That's an oxymoron. Because if I'm demanding thanks from my kids, then I am then taking away the surprise. They can't give me a good surprise gift, which would be Thanksgiving. See, Thanksgiving is a worship event in which you decide to give it. Your freedom is there, see? And I decide to give thanks to the Lord. And so there are the great words that are used. Uh, and there... Uh, in the New Testament, the best way to understand what the word joy means is to look at it in action. I'm just going to do three quick soundings to show you the word in action. And then we'll be able to figure out what this, how this word fits in with mirth. Uh, here's one. Take in the book of John, where our Lord uses the word in John 16. Uh, this is in the Thursday night discourse, just before our Lord goes to the cross. He takes his disciples after the Lord's Supper and gives them this wonderful, what we call, Thursday night discourse. It starts out with John 13 and goes all the way through 16 and there's a high priestly prayer. And in that, in that wonderful section, our Lord uh, uses this word joy in a very dramatic way. Uh, takes John, John 15, right in the middle of the Thursday night discourse. In the Thursday night discourse, Jesus is talking to the disciples as they go down to the Valley Kedron before he's arrested. And he, it's in that section where he says, you believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, what I have told you, that I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll take you to myself. And because I live, you will live also. These wonderful promises are made. And then Jesus says this to them. He says, verse 15, chapter 15, 11, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. There's that word, chara, used, joy. And then over in the 16th chapter, he tells them a parable. And it's, uh, look at this. Amen, amen, I tell you, you will weep and mourn. This is now chapter 16, as he's getting them ready for the fact that he's going to go to the cross. You will weep and mourn, the world will rejoice, but you will have pain, but your pain will be turned to joy. And then he tells them a parable. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. And so you have pain now, but you will see me again and your hearts will rejoice and no one can take your joy from you. Okay, there's the first use of the word joy in a decisive way in the New Testament, at least in this soundings that I'm giving you right now. And notice the joy that's going to be there. It's... Our Lord's promise at this point, and as we know, in a few days, it'll be literally true. And the joy will be the awareness that Jesus Christ has won the victory. Life over death, like a, a, a new birth has occurred. Now you will lament and you will weep, but your weeping will be turned to joy. And at the very end of that great section, he says to them, uh, I have said these uh, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you face persecution. Take courage. I have conquered the world. That's the way he ends the Thursday night discourse. And uh, so you don't, there will be a joy that will come when that dawns on you that I have won. Now, right now, they can't understand it. And they go to the garden. He's arrested. They go to the cross. And then on Easter, this is verified. So that's the first. It's the joy of knowing that death and sin is not as powerful as we thought it was. And the power of the devil is not as powerful as we thought. And Jesus Christ has greater power than the devil and death and our sin. And when that, dawn, when that dawns on you, the result is joy. A tremendous joy when it dawns on you. And a little bit like Frodo and Sam Ganji laughing on the tower of, of the dark tower uh, of Mordor. They're not they're not as intimidated by death because they know of, they, they, they don't know yet the fullness, but they, they're hinting, they're getting hints of something better. Okay, that would be the first place where the, the first sounding I want to do. Now, here's another sounding that's kind of an odd one. It's in the book of James. I wrote a commentary on James, you know, and I taught a class on James here. 
and I did an exposition of this very thing with my James class. But now, James, the first chapter, has this curious paragraph. Verse 2, James writes, the bishop of Jerusalem, uh, during a time of persecution, he writes to these Christians throughout the Roman world, very close to the fall of Jerusalem, he writes this book. And he says, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Now the word chara is going to appear again. Because you know that this testing of your faith, trial, this proving of your faith, produces endurance. There's the great word upomeno that Paul loves. It's Paul's great word for endurance. And now James is using it too. Upomeno means to hang in there. Meno means there to stay, and upo means underneath. To stay underneath and hold on. It's not a triumphalist word, it's an endurance word. He, it, imp, it, it produces endurance, this testing of your faith, of the faithfulness of God, your faith in the faithfulness of God, and that's what James means. It produces endurance. And then he says, and when endurance has its full effect, uh, then you become mature, complete lacking in nothing. And he uses the word here for generosity and health. You end up with a generosity and health that comes from having your faith tested. And when it's tested and you discover that it's true and that it's real and, and lasting, then you get a joy. Now, what's the joy here? If the joy uh, that we saw in John 16, telling about our Lord's prediction of the, of the resurrection, there's a joy knowing that Christ has won the victory. Now, James, writing after the victory of Christ, is telling you about a joy when you realize that you can win a victory, that you can make it. Maybe barely. Notice, he, uses, he doesn't use triumphalist language. He uses the endurance language. You will endure. You're going to make it. Uh, maybe barely, but you're going to make it. And when it dawns on you that over the long haul, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ is stronger than that which is against us and that which we fear. When that dawns on you, it gives you joy. It's that James's definition of joy. It's a little different, notice. It's not so much that Christ has made it, that he has won the victory. That's true too. But you're going to make it. You're going to survive. It may be rough. And James, by the way, you know, a sentence like this not everybody can say. It's like uh, you just go into some hospital room and say, count it all joy when you meet various trials. You may not get away with that. Mother Teresa could go in the hospital room and say it, though, couldn't she? She's earned the right to say it. James has earned the right to say this. Because James, as we know from Josephus, is martyred just maybe a few years, and who knows, maybe months after he wrote this. James is a bishop of Jerusalem who has stayed in Jerusalem. Everybody else is scattered. And he stayed there, and the persecution's getting intense, and he's going to die for his faith. But he has the right to say this, and that's why the book has stayed in the New Testament. By the way, I, I wrote a commentary on James, and I make a big point of that, that uh, one of the proofs for the op apostolic authorship of this book is that the book manages to stay in the New Testament because there are three blatant attacks on the rich in this book. Three times James attacks the rich. And since rich people were endowing the text and endowing the early church to keep it going, it's amazing that they didn't throw it out. It's a great tribute to the early church's integrity and to the fact that this book was an apostolic book. It had authority. There are 61 pieces of advice in the book of James, and it has a lot of clout because of James himself. And when he says at the beginning, count it all joy when you meet trials, because I've discovered that in the trials, the faithfulness of God endures and we make it. And I think that's something, to, that's something to be happy about. You can make it. Now, the third is Paul. And we couldn't do a, a joy a study without looking at Paul. And one of my very favorite of all the Pauline texts on joy is Philippians, the fourth chapter. And notice how he does. Oh, it's so wonderful. This is a, one of the last books Paul wrote. He writes it from prison. He writes it to a church he loves. And he starts out by saying, uh, Therefore, my brothers and sisters whom I love and I long for my joy and my crown. He uses the word here for your athletic crown. You know, my, you're my gold medal. Stand firm in the Lord. Uh, 
my beloved. And then he urges Yodi and Syntyche not to argue anymore because they've had this argument. And then right after he finishes telling them not to argue anymore, verse 4, rejoice. There's the word joy again, chara. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness, here the Greek word epikos is a wonderful word that Paul uses. It literally is the word that means gentle. Uh, it's the word for moderation. I'm kind of intrigued by that. You'd think at the end of Paul's life, writing to a church that's suffering, he would, you'd expect him to say, let your zeal be known to all. Let your hard work be known to all. Instead, he says, let your gentleness be known to all. Your unflappability, I think that's the actual meaning of the word epikos here. Paul wants Christians to be unflappable. We certainly don't need hysterical Christians around here. Would you agree with that? We need unflappable Christians. We need some people that don't panic. And that's what he's saying in the end of this book. Let people know your moderation. We want some people who have their heads on straight, who are thinking clearly, who are moderate. See, and that's what he says. Let all people know your moderation, gentleness. And I love the next half of it. The Lord is nearby. And that's how you can stay mellow. That's the source of the joy. When I know that Jesus Christ is faithful, and let, take James's insight, and that I can make it. When I know that Jesus Christ has won the victory, the victory that matters against sin, death, and the power of the devil, and I know that. And when I know that that Jesus Christ is nearby, then I can relax. And James, John, uh, Paul is asking these Christians at Philippi to relax. Uh, ease up. It's almost like the benediction uh, of the numbers. Peace. In fact, he ends with that word peace. He unites joy with peace in this great text. Here it is. Listen to it. This is one of my very favorite texts of Paul. Rejoice, Lord, always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is nearby. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, Eucharist, see, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all knowledge and understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And he uses the word garrison, guard, there. And so peace is united with joy. It shows that for Paul, joy is not something hysterical. It's not something is where you're just going around saying, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And that's, that's okay, that's fine. But say it a couple of times, then you've said it. Now be at peace, see? Calm down. Put your weight down. Relax. See, that's also joy. See, it's not, it's, it's a scene is a very peaceful thing. And... Uh, there's your three, and those are three soundings of joy. Now let's try to figure out uh, the definition of joy if, that might be a little helpful in this score, too. This, uh, uh, you all have wondered when I'm going to read a reading from C.S. Lewis. Well, now it's his turn. Uh, in the screw tape letters, I think really one of the best treatments of mirth and laughter comes from Lewis. And I now I'm going to let Lewis speak. I, you probably wondered why I didn't start this series with Lewis as the teacher on, on laughter. Uh, but I decided to end our day with Lewis on laughter. Uh, this is letter number 11, where Lewis is actually going to, as you know in the screw tape letters, he uses this satirical device of the senior devil writing to the junior devil. But it gives Lewis a chance to work with various themes of the Christian life. And he's able to focus in on these themes like prayer, the war, it's written in 1941, so World War, I, World War II is a very big factor in the screw tape letters, and a relationship with, of sex, the relationship with, the, with your mother, relationship with the church, and all these different uh, themes. Undulation, he calls it, dryness, all the things, with touchstone of reality theme. He has all these themes that he works with. Here he's going to work with humor. My dear Wormwood, it, everything is clearly going very well. I'm especially glad to hear about the two new friends that have made the acquaintance uh, with a, and they made an acquaintance with the whole set. All these I find from the records office are thoroughly reliable people. 
steady, consistent scoffers and whirlings who, without any spectacular crimes, are progressing quietly and comfortably toward our Father's house. And when Screwtape says that, he doesn't mean toward our Father's house up above. He means our Father's house down below, because he's the devil. Uh, our, uh, you speak of there being great laughers. I trust this does not mean that you're under the impression that laughter as such is always in our favor. The point is worth some attention. And now we get what I think is a brilliant discussion of humor in the New Testament, in, the, in, in, in Christian writing. I divide the causes of human laughter into joy, fun, the joke proper, and flippancy. Uh, now, I'm going to just jump for a minute. The joke proper, Lewis calls the sudden perception of incongruity. And then he gives a, quite a brilliant discussion of British humor, dry humor, British humor, and makes uh, some wonderful comments about it that are whimsical and all the rest. And then he points out that joke proper, its main use to the devil is when it's used for us to excuse our own guilt or to blame someone else or to be a punishing thing on, to our, toward others, like I pointed out when I gave you those examples of where humor can be used actually in a cruel and killing fashion. And it's all excused under the idea that it's a joke. Like that young man tried to do uh, in the newspaper today who sent out the terrible email over there in San Francisco. He just said, oh, it's just a joke. But yet it was in for the kill. It was very harmful. And then he says, flippancy is the best of all. In the first place, it's very economical. Only a clever human can make a real joke about virtue or indeed about anything else. But any of them can be trained to talk as if virtue were funny. Among flippant people, the joke is always assumed to have been made. Uh, no one actually makes it, but every serious subject is discussed in a manner which implies they've already found a ridiculous side to it. If prolonged, the habit of flippancy builds up. This is a great line from Lewis. The habit, he means cynicism by flippancy. He's using flippancy, cynicism the same way. If prolonged, the habit of flippancy or cynicism builds up around a man or woman the finest armor plating against the enemy, that's God, that I know. It is, and it is quite free from the dangers inherent in the other sources of laughter. It is a thousand miles away from joy. Okay, there's his definition of cynicism. Cynicism is a thousand miles away from joy. It doesn't have any of these surprises that are in joy. It's a thousand miles away from joy. It deadens, here's now his definition of cynicism, it deadens instead of sharpening the intellect. That's a surprise. I would have thought being highly cynical should sharpen your intellect. It's not. More naive people have a sharper intellect than cynical people do. Because cynical people have already written so many things off they don't have to learn. You know, it's interesting how cynical journalists have just written off the Christian church. And they've written off, uh, and it made them not good observers. The cynical observers were not able to be good observers of what was happening in Poland because they wrote off the church and didn't understand what was happening in Poland when the uh, whole uh, collapse of Soviet influence on Poland was happening because they, had, they didn't take the church seriously. They had sort of written it off. And whenever you write off a racial group or a different group of people, it doesn't make you a better intellectual. It makes you less intellectual because you're not able to then take in and absorb. And so he's, Lewis is on to something very big there. Among cynical people, he says, uh, the joke is always assumed to have been made. So every serious subject is considered as if you found the ridiculous side to it. So you don't have to take, I don't have to look at that anymore. It's a thousand miles away from joy. It deadens instead of sharpening the intellect. It excites no affection between those people who practice it. And we know how true that is. Okay, those, that's flippancy or cynicism and the joke proper which uh, Lewis gives a little discussion of that's kind of marvelous. Now, the first two, joy and fun. I, devoid, I divide the causes of human laughter into joy, fun, the joke proper, and flippancy. You see the first. Now, here's Lewis's definition of joy. Now, you've got to realize when you're reading screw tape letters that the definition is first filtered through screw tape's eyes. And screw tape is not the best observer. <laughs> so you have to kind of cope with screw tapes observation to find out what Lewis's observation is. But I'll try to do that for you. Here's Lewis's definition of joy. You'll see it among friends and lovers reunited on the eve of a holiday. Notice it has to do with relationship. That's, that's one thing that screw tape is observing. 
Among adults, some pretext in the way of jokes is usually provided, but the facility with which the smallest witticism produces laughter at such a time shows that they're not the real cause. What the real cause is, we do not know. In other words, evil does not understand joy. It's a very important point from Lewis. Something like it is expressed in much of that detestable art which the humans call music. And something like it occurs in heaven. And here's now Screwtape's definition of joy. A meaningless acceleration in the rhythm of celestial experience quite opaque to us. Laughter of this kind does us no good and should always be discouraged. Besides, the phenomena is of itself disgusting and a direct insult to the realism, dignity, and austerity of hell. In other words, uh, hell is much more serious than heaven. Now look at Lewis's definition of joy. You have to take, you see, uh, Screwtape calls it meaningless, so you have to reverse Screwtape. Here's Lewis's definition of joy. Joy is a meaningful, see, Screwtape calls it meaningless, but it's meaningful. It's filled with meaning. It's just that Screwtape can't see it. It's a meaningful acceleration. I love that. There's an energy in joy. It's an acceleration in the rhythm. See, that's why peace can be with joy. In the rhythm, it's not hysterical. Uh, Bonhoeffer made an interesting comment that when you see hysterical laughter, that's a sign of chaos, not of integration of a personality. And very often in an insane asylum or on, in the bombing raids, he said he saw some of the men begin to hysterically laugh. That didn't cheer anybody up. It's like a drunkard who's laughing. A drunkard who comes home and laughs on New Year's Eve does not cheer up the family, folks, as you well know. It's hysterical. It's chaotic. And sometimes it's just uh, so off the wall. I mean, it's so meaningless. But it's a meaningful acceleration in the rhythm of our relationship with God. And it's opaque to evil. Evil cannot figure it out. And I believe, in my opinion, that is probably the best definition, theologically, of New Testament joy, Old Testament joy, the smile of God that I have seen anywhere. It comes from C.S. Lewis. A meaningful acceleration. There is energy in joy. That's what Chesterton's getting at, too. There's this energy in joy. It's a meaningful acceleration in the rhythm. It's rhythmic. That's why peace is in joy of our relationship with God. See, celestial experience. He means our relationship with God, quite opaque to evil. Evil cannot figure it out. And, of course, he says, it's a direct insult to the realism, dignity, and austerity of hell. Kind of thought of a little joke on that score. If somebody is extremely serious, be careful, you may be happier in hell than heaven. Are you really that serious? If a person is terribly grave and knows all the people that are terrible and all the people that should be punished, you may not be as happy in heaven as hell. Because in heaven there's going to be this meaningful acceleration in the rhythm of our relationship with God and it's opaque to evil. But it is a joyous uh, acceleration and rhythm. And uh, Fun is closely related to joy. And here's Lewis's definition of fun that I think is marvelous. A sort of emotional froth arising from the play instinct. It is very little use to us, Screwtape says. It can sometimes be used, of course, to divert humans from something else that the enemy would like them to be doing or feeling. <laughs> but in itself, it has wholly undesirable tendencies, from Screwtape's point of view. It promotes charity, courage, contentment, and many other evils. I love that line. And that's Frodo and Sam Ganji on the Dark Tower. Their laughter about and reminiscence about the Shire and all the people all laughing about good old Sam Ganji and his friend Frodo, Master Frodo, and his good friend Sam Ganji. And they both began to laugh. And when they laughed and they thought of that memory of that friendship and fellowship at the Shire, uh, it, notice what it did. It created courage. It created contentment, it created charity, and many other evils, according to the devil. He hated that. That's why there was an earthquake on Mordor. He didn't like that. He didn't like that laughter. 
and so there was an earthquake. Okay, there is joy, and joy is the source of good humor.